Grüß, uh, wir kommen in einem anderen in Aufregen Video. Welcome to another exciting video. This case episode 54 of my game system design series. In this video, I'll be investigating rolling the dice, or to put it another way, what are some of the rules that designers should consider when creating their dice rolling mechanisms in a set of rules. To say this is a rather bizarre topic is possibly an understatement. I got the idea from a thread on Temp and started thinking about how dice rolling affects the gaming experience, both positive and negative. I've heard some players raise concern about the bucket of dice, preferences for a type of dice over another, and other related dicey topics. I wonder if any of these are significant or simply a subjective player preference which has no real impact on any rules designs. There are two basic factors to consider when we look at dice. These are the type of dice and the number of dice rolls. Dice can be d6, d8, d10, d12, d20 or percentage dice. Rules can also use different dice within the same set of rules. Many rules which use a d10 or d10, 20 also use a d6 for other tables. I spent many years using d20 percentage dice for a set of ancient rules um, called Anabasis and was reasonably happy with it. However, I do remember many other players, many WRG ancient players, used to dislike using a d20 percentage dice and preferred their own dice, which is typically d6. In retrospect, the issue with d20 dice was the lack of familiarity and, of course, you had to go and buy d20 dice. These are all negatives, although I'm not certain how serious they are. If there are negatives, there is normally a payoff, so now we need to ask ourselves what was the advantage of using d20 dice. In the end, I could not think of an advantage, apart from making the rules design simpler. So in retrospect, I have to assume it was a mistake to use them. However, once again, how much of a stake, mistake was it really? I also remember that for rules such as Spearhead, there was a trend in the US to use D10 dice instead of D6 in order to expand the possible results. Outside of the US, this didn't get much traction, and after looking at it myself, I saw minimal benefits in using D10. As a result, I never explored this and was very happy with a D6 in this situation if I was ever involved in any kind of rules design or rules modification. Saying all that, I did use D10 dice when I played Core Commander and never thought much about it. When I came back to relook at the game system, I quickly saw that the use of D10 didn't really provide any benefit. A typical throw would result in three results per column, in most cases zero, one or two. I did not see much reason why a D10 was used in this case, and when I started playing again using the D10, I actually found it annoying as I lacked D10 dice and always had to go and search for them in order to have a game. I have no doubt in some circumstances a D10, D12 or D20 can provide a specific benefit, but in many cases these type of dice are used because they look cool and not because they add a specific game system benefit. As a result, I have to fall back on my classic rules design principle. If you're in tr introducing something new or unusual, what problem is it solving? If the answer is I don't know, or I want to add bling, or the problem is trivial, then the answer is don't do it. Now let's deal with the use of different dice types within a single game system. As a general rule, if your rules use both a d10 and a d6, you're better off picking only one dice type and using it for everything. Many players I am aware of dislike using different dice in a game. Thus, it's best to pick one type and stay with it for everything. If unsure, then stay with d6. However, how important is it? I suspect not very, but simplicity is its own reward. Thus, best to err on the side of simplicity in all case. It should be noted that um, I have to admit this is often a personal preference. D&D players love lots of different dice. Board gamers just want the trusty old D6, while some figure gamers use you know, dice such as D10 and D20. As a game designer, you should always focus on new players, as a set of rules will only grow if new players adopt it. Identify your key market and provide a solution which that market is most comfortable with. I suspect Anabasis, the ancient rules I mentioned early, used D20 dice because many of the new players were old D&D gamers, thus it made sense. Now let's look into the second area of dice, which is how many dice are to be thrown and how often in order to achieve your game system objective without annoying players too much. 
Let's first look at the number of dice to be thrown per throw. While there is obviously an upper limit on how many dice someone can physically throw, I generally find that throwing 1 or 10 dice is similar in terms of effort. In simple terms, there is no physical downside to throwing a lot of dice in a single throw. This can even be exciting and involves lots of moving plastic squares flying everywhere. I actually like it and there are game system benefits to it, most important being reducing the effect of luck. Throwing 12 dice will often give you a reasonable standard distribution and a lot of 1s and 6s represent a very low probability event in this case. As a result, throwing a lot of dice reduces the impact of luck, increases the range of probable outcomes and inserts some excitement to your game. Players who like D10 because it increases the range of probable events can achieve the same thing by throwing more than one D6. There are downsides to the bucket of dice system, but this does depend on the game system itself. While throwing a single D6, you can leave that dice in its final state next to the unit affected. Thus, you can see what's happening easily. If you throw 12 dice, this is not as convenient. As long as you are not required to throw 100 dice, then throwing more than one dice is probably not an issue when it's a single throw. The number of dice to throw is purely determined by your game system objectives. Now we come to an interesting question. How many times should a player throw a dice, or more than one dice, in a typical game before it becomes annoying? If we look at a board game, in this case the SPI Napoleon at War board game, specifically the Vagram scenario, the game lasts for 14 game turns, of which the first involves no combat, and there are two night turns, thus no combat during these two game turns. This leaves us with 11 game turns which involve combat, and thus die rolls. During game turns where combat does occur, the French player will typically launch four attacks and three counterattacks per game turn, with the Austrians a similar amount. That represents seven die rolls per player per game turn for 11 game turns, or a total of 77 die rolls over the period of about two to three hours. If we say three hours, that is 26 die rolls per hour per player. This frequency is based on a figure game version of the Vagram scenario that I have created. As I took photos of each combat, I have a reasonably accurate count of the game die rolls. That is, I took a photograph after every single player turn. Thus, I can go back to my photos and look at exactly how many die rolls I threw. In addition to this example, I've created a number of playtest videos. So during a game of a figure game version of the SPI Modern Battles Versberg scenario, the number of die rolls were greater for the Soviets and less for the US. But if we combine both players, we are getting about 60 die rolls for both players per hour. I then went back to some pure figure game rules and had some issues with doing this calculation as the dice thrown throws are wildly variable by game turn. For a game of uh, WRG Micro Armor, in this case Cold War, where we actually had a firefight, the die rolls peaked in a single ga game turn, with my Leopard 2 company spinning about 60 die rolls within basically a very short period of time. This is mainly because a single shot requires more than a single die roll. The rest of the game had almost no die rolls in it. When I went back to WRG Napoleonic's rules, I had a similar experience, but not quite as severe. As a result, it was difficult to pin down the number of die rolls used during these rules, or playing these rules. But when the rounds were flying, that is, actual combat rounds, the die rolling was pretty intense. I then went back to another set of micro-armor rules, figure game rules, LWRS, to see what the die roll frequency was like. In my LWRS scenarios, I use a fixed game length in terms of game turns and well-defined victory conditions, which forces the attacker to move forward as quickly as possible. In this case, the first game turn consisted of only a few die rolls for move order and quality, while the second game turn represented heavy fighting. There were two combats, each consisting of about eight die rolls for the attacker and four die rolls for the defender in terms of save rolls including air support, indirect fire, quality and move order. A total of 40 die rolls for game turn 2 was basically the number. Less for game turn 3 and by game turn 4 there was a break, so, though, so the number of die rolls dropped dramatically. The game ended at game turn 6 after 3 hours and almost 150 die rolls, or about a total of 50 die rolls for both players and 25 rolls 
per player per hour. Quite a number of these die were rolled together. If we count separate physical throws, irrespective of the number of the dies, we end up with about 180 throws, or 36 per hour for both players, and 18 rolls per player per hour. In none of these games did I consider the die rolling to be excessive. Thus we can assume the die rolling frequency of between 18 and 40 per hour per player is reasonable. A quick point about this example. In all these examples, the calculation, calculating involved in each die roll was trivial. For LWRS, it was a simple 4 plus or 5 plus. And for Napoleon at War, it was a simple odds. Setting up each die roll did not require much effort. Only save rolls required consulting modifiers. When I played WRG Micro Armour, and when it was an intensive firefight, which I must admit is a rare occasion, the amount of die rolling was excessive. The reason this was an issue was the calculating involved in each roll. I had to apply a list of modifiers to each roll. In the most parts, I was able to memorise the modifier, but I still verbally listed them for each roll so my opponent could check. In this case, I was playing a competition game, so it was highly competitive. I could get through these quickly because I had memorised the modifier tables. New players will not have this particular luxury. Now let's look at another set of micro armor rules, in this case, Core Commander. This is a rather complex game and I need to keep the force mixes down in order to allow for the game to complete within a day. The die rolling was minimal compared with many other rules, but the calculation behind each die roll was intense. A reasonably sized game involves 24 elements per side, with combat normally involving 4 to 6 elements per case. A 4 to 6 element face-off could involve as little as 8 to 12 die rolls per game turn, but the effort involved was so great that this could take as long as an hour. There were not many of these encounters, luckily, as if there was, then the game would, uh, be, would go well beyond a day. The die roll intensity was low in this case, but the effort per die roll was very, very high. My conclusion is the issue with die rolling is not the physical die rolling, but the calculation required for each die roll. If it's simple, then the limit of die rolling is physical. If complex, then each die roll can be a painful process, which if repeated enough will cause a loss of interest in the game. Most of the issues around throwing a dice is not the actual throwing of the dice, or dices, but the calculation required in order to throw it. In retrospect, this may have been an anti-climax video, but I must admit, when I started it um, and did my research, I was really looking for some critical rule concerning the type of dice and the number of dice which should be thrown in a set of rules. In the end, I discovered these were trivial, and it was the mental effort to allow you to throw the dice which was the key factor, calculation and referencing a table of modifiers. And so this concludes episode 54 of my video series on game design theory. In this case, I'm trying to identify the optimal die rolling game system. Allah gooden ding, commons u einem ende.